Um, hi, everyone, and thank you so much for coming to this week's BD seminar. Um, so I'm really um, pleased to introduce Lara Urban. Um, she's from the Helmholtz Pioneer Campus uh, in Munich and also is a faculty member at the Technical University of Munich. Uh, Lara just moved here from New Zealand. Um, I'm just going to talk about a lot of the work that she did in New Zealand. I'm going to let her introduce herself and her projects. Um, and yeah, it's um, really exciting that she could be here today um, to talk about what she's what she's working on because I think there's a lot of potential for collaborations within WSL, especially given the short distance. Okay, so Laura, take it away. Let me switch myself on. Can you hear me well? like this. Um, yeah, Nadia, let me know if online there's any problem, right? Yeah, thanks so much, Debbie, for inviting me and thanks for organizing. Super happy to talk here today. Uh, yeah, so I will very generally talk about real-time genomic approaches for One Health. So we are really using genomic uh, approaches and uh, different analysis methods to better understand One Health and to be better able to monitor One Health as well. As Debbie nicely introduced uh, already, I'm a principal investigator at Helmholtz Munich, which is the German National Center for Environmental Health, and here specifically at the Helmholtz Pioneer Campus and also at the Helmholtz AI Institute. So, but yeah, let's uh, jump in uh, by talking a little bit about, uh, like, firstly, what actually One Health means, right, which I assume a lot of you already know. So the concept of One Health affirms that human health and the health of our environment and the health of all animals and plants and organisms is inextricably linked which does make a lot of sense when you think about many examples such as the impact of air pollution on human health, the excess, um, uh, the impact of access to fresh water um, on, on like general human health and sanity. And obviously zoonotic diseases like uh, the COVID-19 pandemic are also a really, really good example. And I think because of that, uh, because of COVID-19, One Health has really been catapulted in the center of also societal discussions. Uh, and uh, by now, uh, COVID-19 pandemic has really been accepted to be linked to the loss of biodiversity and the loss of wild habitats. That's something that really like political leadership, public opinion, and also international research institutes have accepted by now. So to really briefly give you a background of my own research, uh, it's sort of like funny because I, I think I've always worked quite interdisciplinarily and always sort of related to One Health, but I've only now that I've started my own research group started using the, the, the term itself. So to give you a quick overview of my research, so my bachelor's and master's research was actually in ecological and bioinformatics research, but then for my PhD I moved to the University of Cambridge and to the European Bioinformatics Institute, which is an outstation of the European Molecular Biology Labor Laboratory in Heidelberg and uh, studied cancer genomics and like really like big data, statistical genomics, single cell genomics, and also deep learning in genomics. But then I wanted to combine this sort of research uh, with uh, my actual interest in ecology and nature conservation. So I decided uh, to move to New Zealand after my PhD where, um, oh, I see that the slides are a little bit cut, eh? Um, it's not a problem right now, I think. Um, and Zoom, they can see everything. Okay, like here, I, I will I will see if we miss anything. Um, but so where I was funded by an Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship and, and uh, uh, spent like two and a half years there working directly with the National Department of Conservation to really include genomic research into active day-to-day -day, um, conservation uh, management. And this is how I also got involved with the uh, International Union for Conservation of Nature or IUCN Conservation Genetic Specialist Group. And that's how Debbie and I met uh, um, sometime last year in Edinburgh and have since seen, been in touch about all sorts of conservation genomic uh, issues. Uh, I've also sort of worked like really at the intersection of like the human health and the environmental health part, like in the fields of freshwater monitoring, wastewater epidemiology. So these were the wastewater monitoring efforts in New Zealand during the COVID-19 pandemic and also for other in situ health applications. But I'm going to talk a little bit about um, this later. So, um, uh, and now we come to the next, uh, I guess, concept in my title. So how do we try to use real-time genomics to better understand One Health and monitor One Health? 
So with real-time genomics, I really mean nanopore sequencing because nanopore sequencing is really the only genomic method that we can currently use to do genomics in real time. So how does nanopore sequencing work? You have like this a sequencing flow cell um, that is like really tiny and you have like a, a membrane embedded in this flow cell with, with tiny nanopores. And how it works is that uh, your uh, single-stranded DNA um, passes through uh, these pores embedded in this membrane. And because there is voltage applied to this membrane, there's also like an iron current going through these uh, nanopores. And the DNA based on the specific DNA sequence will disrupt the iron current in a specific way. And then you are using this signal to base call uh, this like really raw signal, um, which is also called the squiggle signal into actual DNA sequence. And this is really, really cool because this makes nanopore sequencing the only approach that actually allows you to sequence the native DNA. Um, this means that we can get really long uh, DNA reads because we don't have to cut them up or synthesize them in any way. It means we can read any sort of other modification from this DNA strand, like for example, um, epigenetic modifications, because they will disrupt this ion current in a very specific way. And we can also use this information to base call into the epigenetic modifications. Also, um, this means we can do really real-time genomics, because if we pair this with efficient artificial intelligence or AI algorithms and powerful GPUs, we can, at the very moment that the DNA passes through the pore, base call it into the actual DNA sequence. So we will get the results super fast. And this means we can modulate our experiment, we can sequence as long as we want or as short as we want, and we can, importantly, do selective sequencing, meaning we can provide a digital DNA sequence that we are interested in, you know, for example, the human reference genome, and tell the pores we only want to sequence human DNA. So what the pore will do while sequencing a strand, it will base call the first part um, of the DNA strand, map it to the human reference genome, and then decide, oh, am I interested in this DNA or not? And depending on that, either eject it or continue sequencing it, meaning we are doing real-time selective sequencing which is super exciting. And when we pair like this nanopore sequencing, which is possible on like these portable uh, sequences that I'm sure you've seen before, like the Minayan up here, with portable powerful GPUs, then we can actually do all of this, including the data analysis in the field. So really like during field work, or if you think more clinically at the point of care. So I think these are all the advantages why I love using nanopore sequencing. And that's why I like the talk today will focus on real-time genomics for nanopore sequencing. So uh, very briefly to introduce my research group that I've only started uh, last June. So I'm still a very junior um, PI, but I want to show you of how we are using real-time genomics for One Health very broadly. So we are using it, and I know we are at the biodiversity seminar today, for biodiversity monitoring, still continuing work from my time uh, in New Zealand for actually um, non-invasively monitoring critically endangered species. And this is work that's being continued by master students Linus and Daniel. Um, we are also using real-time genomics for actual environmental monitoring, especially for freshwater monitoring. And this is work done by master student Anastasia. And we are going more into also combining this research with global health or human health questions. So we have started using real-time genomics for um, uh, air pollution monitoring. That's work by PhD student Tim. And yeah, I think it's really a little bit cut off, eh? but we can't do anything about it right now, no? I guess. Yeah, don't worry. Yeah, so, so we also use like um, more big scale remote sensing um, approaches to um, uh, to, to understand general um, like uh, land usage and air pollution patterns on the earth. And that's uh, work done by PhD student Harika, whose face you just have to imagine now. Uh, or you can look it up on our website. <laughs> and we, we, we really brought real-time genomics into clinics as well in collaboration with uh, clinics in Zimbabwe and Munich. And that's work led by uh, medical doctor Ella. Um, we use it, and I think this might be interesting for, for you guys, but this is work that we are only starting right now, it for um, monitoring uh, zoonotic diseases and how they spread in the wild. So uh, Postdoc Alberti is joining us uh, from the Cresa Institute in Barcelona to work on influenza A virus using nanopore sequencing. And then we have Postdoc Amit who is working on the more computational side. So I think 
Okay, I think that's enough of introduction, right? So this is like sort of what, what the lab is doing right now. But I thought I would focus specifically on the biodiversity part today and talk about the other things a little bit in the end if I have time. So uh, about uh, my, my research um, in New Zealand, um, where I really focused on conservation genomics purely. I guess, uh, you know, people have asked me why I moved to the other side of the world for, for my postdoctoral stint, but I think like the picture up there shows you, um, Alon, it was very nice to uh, spend two years uh, in New Zealand during that time. Um, but like more seriously, obviously New Zealand has a lot of critically endangered species that you can apply um, genomic approaches to. And there are just a few of the species that I've worked on during my time in New Zealand. Plus you can really directly work with the conservationists of the Department of Conservation who are super eager to implement any genomic results or, uh, um, or like any scientific findings into their uh, management. And uh, um, my actual main project was on the critically endangered Takahe species, a flightless rail uh, that is endemic to New Zealand, where I led all the work from like funding acquisition, field work, laboratory work to computational analysis. And we also uh, designed a methodology for haplotype resolved um, assembly uh, using like uh, different sequencing methods, including um, PEC bio, uh, if you're interested in that line of work. But I thought today I would focus on my research on the kakapo, which is often the favorite <laughs> of the people because it has become very famous, I think, as a symbol of conservation uh, management. So the kakapo is a critically endangered parrot species, also endemic to New Zealand. It's flightless. And this is because, and this is why it is so endangered, because humans introduced a lot of invasive predators uh, into uh, New Zealand. And so the kakapo just had no uh, way to escape from those. There uh, are only 249 individuals left uh, as of today, and the population was down to only 50 individuals in the 90s. So it has gone through a huge bottleneck, meaning it's like highly inbred. All the individuals are closely related to each other. And here I would really like to acknowledge um, the amazing uh, conservation team, the Kakapo recovery team in New Zealand, with whom I've done like a lot of work on the Kakapo. And also um, the Maori Iwi or the Maori tribe, um, um, who are the kaitiaki or guardians of this species. Because in New Zealand, when you want to work on any of the so-called taonga or treasured species, you have to do this in direct collaboration with the Maori, which I think is a very, um, very good and necessary concept to work actually with the indigenous people. Um, of uh, this country. So I would like to now dig into like one specific Kakapo research project um, that I've actually started yeah, quite some time ago now, where we were interested in can we um, non-invasively monitor the Kakapo species? Because at the moment, all the Kakapo individuals live on remote islands um, to be safe from the invasive predators. But the idea is to, in the long term, reintroduce them to the New Zealand main islands. Now, at the moment, like the, the monitoring is very invasive, like the, the, the individuals are captured all the time, they're actually getting used to humans and so on. And this is not what we want to do in the long term. So our idea was, can we use environmental material to monitor the kakapo, monitor the spread of the kakapo, like sort of the range that they, they, they live in, but also maybe get some more information about their genomic health as the population is recovering. So I went to one or the main actually kakapo island, uh, to uh, do a pilot study and you see like the different sampling locations here uh, where I took soil samples to look for evidence of kakapo DNA. And I first um, conducted a very traditional, I would say environmental DNA or eDNA um, um, project where we would look into one specific market gene, in this case, the 12 srRNA, to look into like bird and mammal diversity that we could find in these soil samples. So we would amplify this specific region, uh, so a very tiny region of the genome, and just look into diversity of species. And what you find here, uh, so this is just the overview of what we find ac found across the samples. It's, it makes a lot of sense. We found a lot of... Uh, um, uh, native, but also invasive bird species. We found a lot of human, which makes sense because there are quite a, a few conservationists on the island. Um, we found invasive uh, predators. Uh, we also found a critically endangered bat species, which was really cool. Um, and importantly, we found um, evidence of kakapo um, in the parrot branch as well. So which means, okay, in general, we can use the soil uh, samples to detect uh, evidence of kakapo. Um, 
so here's just like a bit of a breakup of, of what exactly we found. So the, the, what we sampled were like so-called bowls. Uh, these are the mating uh, places of the kakapo males where they sit in to shout for the females. We sampled at feeding stations, uh, we sampled abandoned nests, and we also as a positive control sampled uh, the aviaries of kia and kaka, which are the most closely related species of the kakapo to see if we can distinguish the signal. Now we sampled at different distances, like directly at the spot, plus at four meters and at 20 meters. We took the, uh, several replicates, we, which are um, uh, summarized in these plots, and we sampled two locations of each of these uh, sampling locations. So, and I think uh, like what, what you can appreciate is that in the bowls, we like find a lot of kakapo DNA at the center, but the signal drops very quickly with distance, meaning that we have a actually highly spatially resolved signal here, which makes a lot of sense because basically when a kakapo has walked over some soil, we find it. If it's a little bit further in the distance and uh, the soil hasn't been touched, we don't find it. Um, also at the, at the feeding stations, we find quite some evidence of kakapo. Um, uh, here we had a sample dropout. At, at the abandoned nests, we only find like a little bit of kakapo DNA, which means it's also a um, highly temporally resolved signal because we see that the signal gets lost um, after just one or two months. And we don't find any uh, kakapo DNA in the aviaries as expected. Um, uh, so we can distinguish the kakapo from its closely related species. So it seems that this approach is working really well. Uh, so um, uh, in general, right, to detect biodiversity and to detect kakapo. Now we were thinking, can we push this approach a little bit further and actually look into what I beforehand called the genomic health of the kakapo? So look beyond the marker gene, but ideally like genome-wide data from the kakapo to understand um, factors such as genetic diversity and inbreeding, which can be important for recovery. So this is where nanopore sequencing comes in again. So this is just... Uh, you know, like uh, the same thing that I showed you before, and, and that like the DNA uh, that we sequence passes uh, through this nanopore and results into this electrical signal, also called squiggle signal. Now, I, I told you before about the selective sequencing that we now leverage to actually try and only sequence kakapo DNA from the soil samples, because most of the DNA in the soil samples obviously comes from bacteria and fungi that we are not actually interested in. So a question was, can we use this and the high quality kakapo reference genome to tell the pores, hey, we only want to sequence kakapo DNA from these soil samples. Um, yeah, and this is what we did uh, for um, uh, a few samples. And uh, here are the results that we get. So I'm just showing you the result from a single sample now, a single soil sample, where I, I got like the, the long reads from the nanopore or relatively long reads that map to the kakapo genome using this selective sequencing approach. And I then I used these long reads to define haplotypes, right? So this is also the advantage of having long reads that we have multiple genetic variants on it, meaning it's like entire haplotype that we get from one individual. We know it's one individual because it's only one strand. And we compare this haplotype to the actual kakapo uh, um, uh, population from which we have like a lot of genomic data. And here I calculated a haplotype agreement plot, meaning I'm just comparing our haplotype from the soil sample to the haplotype of the population. And um, on, on the y-axis, you see the number of individuals that have this haplotype agreement plot in our kakapo population. And like based on this approach, we actually find that the kakapo called moss has the best hit for the haplotype agreement plot in this case. And so we went back to our metadata about um, the, the my sampling sites, and I indeed found that I took this sample from the bowl from, from the kakapo moss. So that was a little bit of a eureka moment. You only see the dancing kakapo half, damn it. <laughs> the online people see it, so it's fine. Um, so that was a bit of a eureka moment because I think at least using this nanopore sequencing approach, it was the first time that we have achieved individual identification from non-invasive samples. Um, um, yeah, um, yeah, just using non-invasive samples. So um, then we also used a different approach, a Bayesian inference approach, uh, which also just looked at these long haplotypes and looked into the, the proportion of reads that would map to a certain kakapo individual and also the posterior uh, probability. And we again see that the kakapo moss is the best hit for this sample. Um, 
uh, sorry, but we also we also find uh, that Sinbad uh, has like a, a, another kakapo has quite a few hits. And Sinbad is a kakapo that is really not at all related to moss or quite little related to, to moss. So it couldn't be like that there is some mix up because of relatedness. And indeed, when we look up into the haplotype agreement plot, we also find that our second best hit here is also the kakapo Sinbad. So this was a little bit weird, but at this moment, I just thought, okay, let's let's look at some other samples. So I looked into two other samples in the same way, yeah, sequence them with the selective nanopore sequencing approach. Here again, we have most bowl. I also sequenced MERV's nest and Nora's feeding station. For MERV's nest, we have MERV as the second hit. Sinbad, again, is the best hit. So this was really weird. At Nora's feeding station, we have Sapphire, the Kakapo is the second hit, and Sinbad, again, is the first hit. Now I have to say that Sapphire is, uh, is Nora's daughter. So I think this was, you know, like a mix up based on relatedness that the genomic material was just really similar. Whereas here in the Bayesian inference approach, we actually find Nora is the best hit for this, uh, for this sample. So, but anyways, what, what is the Sinbad doing everywhere, right? Like, I, I, I like these results so much, but, uh, but the Sinbad showed up everywhere. So, I think for some time, I really looked into the genomic data, tried to figure out why we could find some signal of Sinbad there, until actually my conservation collaborator, Andrew Digby, was like, okay, what if Sinbad was really there <laughs> at that time? So his like uh, habitat was actually on the complete other side of the island, and we wouldn't expect him to be around there. But luckily, they are tracing the movement of the individual kakapo using radio telemetry. And we looked into the data during my sampling time, and you can indeed see. So here we have our sampling stations that we um, sequenced with nanopore, moss bowl, Nora's feeding station, MERV's bowl. And here is Sinbad's bowl, I said, like not expected that he would be anywhere here. But actually one day before I sampled, Sinbad was here. Meaning really he might have just visited these sites. You know, I mean, they are quite curious. They follow up on each other. And really showing that, that we found Sinbad's uh, DNA there probably made sense. So that was actually quite a um, cute story in the end, whereas I was getting so annoyed with Sinbad uh, during a long time. Um, so now this was like really just a pilot study showing that we can do this individual identification. Obviously with Kakapo, we have like a lot of genomic data of the population, which we might not have for other populations. But I think it's like a first hint that we can actually use this selective nanopore sequencing to retrieve more uh, data than just the presence of species. Ideally, maybe telling us something about population structure and inbreeding in the future. And this is something we are following up on at the moment. So uh, very briefly, uh, um, we're talking about another Kakapo project where we used very similar approach to, uh, to also contribute to conservation of Kakapo, but in a very different manner, where we uh, um, uh, looked actually for evidence of aspergillus infections, because aspergillosis has been a disease that has infected the newly hatched chicks for several years now, um, but the identification is like very slow because we have to swap the chicks, which you can see here doing a, as in the middle of the night when the kakapo mom leaves the nest, we go into the nest and swap the chicks. But afterwards, normally we have to wait for the next helicopter to come, which can be one or two weeks to ship off the samples from the island. And until we actually get a positive result back, the chick has normally deteriorated a lot in health or has even died. So we were like thinking, okay, perfect, we can use this portable genomic approaches to bring this onto the island. And that's what I did uh, like for three months of last year, which was a very beautiful time spending on the island where we actually brought the Minayan sequencer and this portable GPU that I was talking into the field uh, um, and sequenced the entire microbiome um, of the uh, saliva to detect uh, uh, yeah, evidence of aspergillosis. And uh, we are still analyzing the results of this um, at the moment because our problem was that we never swapped a chick that actually developed aspergillosis afterwards, which means we don't actually have evidence that we can detect um, like increased level of aspergillus. So I'm just showing you the project in general. I've given a talk. Uh, yeah, you also don't see my... I, we will just make the slides available afterwards. So because I've given a talk about this at a conference in detail last year, so you can you can check that out if that interests you. Uh, but the results are not very conclusive at the moment. Just want to mention that part of this is, as I said, that the importance here is really bringing this approach into the field and also training our conservation collaborators 
um, so that they can actually just use uh, this approach in the future and not we scientists have to be there all the time. Whereas I wouldn't mind <laughs> going back, um, but uh, so that they can uh, use this approach in the long term. Cool. This was like just some example of the biodiversity work I've been doing in New Zealand. Uh, very happy to talk about some other projects uh, too, if you're interested uh, later on. But now I wanted to give you a few examples about how we can use uh, these real-time genomic approaches to go a bit more into the human health or global health um, space. Because obviously having this portable real-time approach can help us a lot for any, any like sort of point of care analysis. And you can think about different examples like using this in hospitals, um, at the side of like increased traffic, when you think about you know future pandemics like airports, in in the agricultural um, space and basically all around the world, because this is also something that's really important to me that technologies that we develop we can actually bring anywhere in the world and it's not only restricted you know to like the wealthy European and US countries. Uh, so just a few examples of how I've been using real-time genomics uh, for human health. So um, I've been um, advisor to the Accessible Genomics pro uh, Project that tries to bring genomic approaches to low-income countries in the global south. We've established real-time genomics in a, um, a, gyneco a gynecological clinic in Vienna to understand the impact of the microbiome on in vitro fertilization success. Uh, we have uh, in New Zealand assessed uh, the risk um, or the impact of uh, like really like long copy number variations in cardiovascular risk genes on the, onto the actual risk of developing such disease in the indigenous people, where it's super important that all the material and data actually remains in the country because Maori would never agree on having like their even their DNA being shipped or transferred abroad. So, so if, I think with respect to that, any sort of ethical issues, it's also really, really important thinking about the Nagoya protocol always, obviously. And then we've also established nanopore sequencing for freshwater um, monitoring, um, where this was actually my very first nanopore uh, project that I started next to my PhD back in Cambridge, where we used, uh, that was 16 sRNA based uh, bacterial identification using nanopore sequencing. Um, and we like monitored the entire river chem, like from upstream uh, through the city to the, to, to, to the downstream um, area. And upstream here, you obviously have like a very natural environment. Then you have like all the anthropogenic impact in the city and then downstream, you have like a lot of anglers and rowers. And uh, importantly, you have this wastewater uh, uh, pipe outlet that really interested us what we would find there. So we, we basically, you know, had like this entire gradient of anthropogenic impact in, in the one city. And to just briefly show you what we can find with respect to, you know, like microbiome research using nanopore sequencing. So we looked into specifically pathogenic candidates. So these are like a, a potentially pathogenic bacterial genera. And these are um, bacterial genera that are being used in wastewater treatment plants. And here again, you can see like from upstream to the river to downstream of the river, all of our sampling sites. And what we what we really find is that, um, that we find more potentially human pathogens downstream. Um, so meaning that they are probably being enriched by like this anthropogenic impact onto the river, as well as we find like a lot of like wastewater treatment associated bacteria downstream of this wastewater treatment plant, which was, if I go back, um, the number eight here, right? So it, um, we, we definitely we are able to uh, define bacterial communities according to what we would expect um, at these locations. We are only doing this on the bacterial genus level because back then nanopore sequencing still had a quite high error rate of around 5%, meaning that if you only look into the 16S RNA region, so we looked at the full length 16S, you might often not have a lot of differences between species or or strains in the 16S area. So um, uh, like just one sequencing error could actually lead you to define like another strain or species. So which means as we actually like stuck to the bacterial genus level here. Having said that, actually nanopore sequencing accuracy has uh, increased a lot and it's now at 99.4%. So I would really love to redo the study like that with the, with, with the current um, sequencing chemistry. So this is why we are working on bacterial genus, right? But like what, what really interested us is 
is that um, at this wastewater treatment plant, despite all these wastewater associated bacteria, we also found evidence of Leptospira. Now Leptospira, I was like, I was always like, when I've got new results from the river, I was always like looking for Leptospira because we were all involved into the rowing community, you know, like everyone in, in Cambridge is rowing. It's true. It's not only a, um, a prejudice. And uh, Leptospira can cause really uh, bad infections, especially in rowers who have like, um, you know, like wounds on their hands and then the water gets into the hands and uh, they can easily get leptospirosis, which can even be deadly in the worst case. So this finding this evidence of leptospira, especially at the wastewater treatment plant, maybe uh, pointing towards that um, the wastewater treatment plant outflow could, um, you know, like enrich uh, for uh, for leptospira um, was like a little bit troublesome. At the same time, there are loads of leptospira species and strains that are just saprophytic, meaning they just occur in the environment, right? And he, there it was a problem that we only worked on the genus level. So we were thinking of how we could uh, go beyond this. And we um, uh, what we did is we extracted all the publicly available 16S RNA data that was available for the Leptospira genus and aligned it to our Leptospira reads that we got and built this my, uh, phylogenetic tree here. And um, basically, so what you see here is our reads are in, in the color coded here in the middle. Uh, I think it stopped working now, but yeah. Yeah, as long as the thing just works. But like, so in the middle of the phylogenetic tree, you can find um, all of the the our reads that are color coded according to the samples um, that we got. Whereas the outer um, uh, circle is like the reads that we got from the databases. And I think because again, you guys can't see anything right now and not everything right now, but if you look into the middle phylogenetic tree, um, whoa, okay. Good, <laughs> let's use that. Uh, yeah, and sorry for the online folks, I, I will try to explain as well as possible. But um, uh, so when if you look into here in the middle now, right, you, you see like the green and the blue reads that we have here are the database reads um, um, that are basically saprophytic or neutral leptospira uh, strains and species, whereas the violet ones are the pathogenic ones. And we really see that the violet ones, they nicely cluster together, like away from our own reads, whereas the more saprophytic ones are sort of clustered within um, our own reads. So we hypothesized that this might point towards that the reads that we find are actually saprophytic or not pathogenic. But we used like um, an additional, like uh, traditional PCR based method to uh, confirm this, and we indeed found that in our samples we only had saprophytic leptospira, meaning that already back then we were sort of able to, you know, like really go onto the strain level with nanopore sequencing if we were actually interested in it. But now, I mean, as I said, the data is so much better. And we are uh, continuing this work right now using um, also shotgun sequencing, which means we are sequencing all the DNA um, in the river, which also tells us something about DNA viruses, about fungi, uh, you know, about just anything that is in there. And we are getting some really cool results. And we have sampled the wastewater uh, switch pipe a few more times. And we actually now find evidence of pathogenic leptospira in there. Um, I haven't included any slides because our analysis are very like technical and statistical at the moment, but if you have more questions about that, we can talk about this later. Um, so yeah, and with that, I really briefly want to talk about uh, monitoring air using nanopore sequencing uh, as well, like going from water monitoring now to air monitoring, because uh, I think there we are also amongst the first to apply nanopore sequencing for actually understanding the air microbiome. So why we are interested in this is because air pollution obviously has a huge effect on human health. And in Europe, it's actually uh, said that it's the biggest environmental threat to human health. And here you just see like the estimated uh, lost years of life just because of air pollution due to small particulate matter. So particulate matter that is smaller than 2.5 micrometers, which can easily get into your lungs and cause different sorts of diseases, respiratory diseases, but also it also has impacts on other diseases such as uh, yeah, diabetes uh, 2 and like different cancer types and so on. 
And here we, we have started working on two different fronts. So firstly, we want to automate the DNA extraction approach more to like ideally, you know, like bring this um, air monitoring approaches anywhere into the world, right? So that you can just ideally at some point put a small machine there that will just do everything automatically. So we've started using this cartridge-based um, approaches to have like a one-step DNA extraction, uh, which we are still um, uh, optimizing at the moment. And on the very other end, we have worked on like remote sensing technologies to firstly in the very big picture understand air pollution patterns um, and also land usage patterns and how those correlate to air pollution patterns to then go into the field and actually um, sample the air microbiome and understand how sort of bigger um, patterns have an impact onto the, the molecular air microbiome in the end. So then for the genomic approach, right, to actually uh, yeah, understand uh, what's, what we have in, in the air, we are using uh, the Coriolis air samplers, which uses a uh, uh, cyclonic force to suck in the air. And then like all the material is basically being pressed to the, to, to the outside of this cone. And you can then yeah, get, get all the material from this cone at the end and uh, extract your DNA and sequence it. Now, um, with this approach, you can sequence or you can filter a lot of air. So we are like filtering 300 liters per minute for like, you know, at least half an hour, sometimes longer. And that's really necessary because we don't have a lot of genomic material in air, as you can imagine. So we, we, we do need uh, to, to enrich it quite a lot. And then we are again, surprise, <laughs> using nanopore sequencing to sequence also in this case, all of the DNA that is in there. So a shotgun approach that is not like not only focusing on bacteria, but in theory, we are looking at everything because obviously air microbiome could be fungi. We know aspergillus has an impact on human health, could be viruses. Adenovirus, for example, has an impact on, on, uh, on human health via the air um, or also like pollen or um, yeah, any, anything basically that's floating around in the air. Um, we are getting this squiggle signal that I've told you about before, the ion currents, that we can then base call into our actual DNA sequence and then use um, assembly-based methods that like use all of the DNA um, that we get to try to build like near complete genomes from individuals which like gives us a lot more certainty that a specific individual is there than just mapping our data to some database. Because if we firstly have the entire genome and then use databases to classify it, we really have a lot more evidence than when we just use a read that might occur in like several um, species and map this to the database. Plus these assemblies also allow us to annotate the function of these organisms, such as antimicrobial resistance or specific virulence um, factors that might be very interesting for human health. So, and now I'm very happy to show you some first uh, uh, air microbiome results using nanopore sequencing, but we really only got those recently because we had to optimize a lot. And here on the left, you firstly see the redistribution of three different uh, uh, sampling approaches that we used. And this is, by the way, a collaboration with the IS Global Institute in Barcelona, which is a, uh, yeah, like uh, a global health and planetary health research institute there. And um, so this is basically the air microbiome of Barcelona that you are going to see now. Um, so, so what you see here is on the x-axis in these plots, um, we have the read length and in base pairs. Uh, yeah, the x-axis label is cut off. Um, and, and on the y-axis, we have the number of kilobases that we get, right? So you do see, I mean, we have sort of a peak at maybe around 200 uh, something, you know, a base pairs. That means we, we get quite short reads, right? Because nanopore sequencing reads are normally longer than that. But that's also expected because we just have probably very fragmented DNA in our samples. But still, we get a, a, a few quite long reads, which will help us to, do, to create these assemblies that I was talking about. And here are some very preliminary results of these three samples taking together what, what we find um, in terms of uh, the microbial community. And firstly, it's actually interesting that we mostly find bacteria 
but we do have to check our underlying database um, that we actually have everything included. I mean, the most common fungi should be in there, so we haven't found anything um, there. Um, but yeah, we, we really have to dig into this a bit more. I just thought I would show you some, some nanopore air microbiome today. I think the most interesting thing is what I haven't seen in any other samples that I've studied before is that uh, Sphingomonas is the most uh, dominant um, uh, a bacterial uh, taxon up here. And Sphingomonas um, is a typical environmental bacterium that occurs, I think, on plants, in soil, and so on. But it's also known to be like uh, specifically robust and to not and need a lot of nutrients uh, to survive, which would obviously make a lot of sense in the air that this is why it can actually, uh, you know, occur in the air in a quite dominant manner. Yeah, and all of the other bacterial, you know, there are some human skin microbiota there, which makes sense, um, you know, to, to find those in the air. And it all it all makes, makes sense, but we are digging more into this. So please stay tuned if you're interested in that line of research. And um, I quickly want to mention one other thing about this project, because so, as I've told you, what we get in the first place is this quiggle data, right? Like now from our um, air DNA. Before base calling it into the DNA sequence, we can in theory do like a lot of other approaches. As said before, for example, call epigenetic modifications from it. Now, while, while actually going running here in Uckleberg <laughs> one day, I like I had a little bit of a crazy idea and was thinking, wait, can we use this approach and actually distinguish if a DNA comes from a dead or a viable organism? Because for those of you who are from microbiological field, with like this uh, genetic microbiome approaches, this is often the problem that we just get DNA from everything, but it could very well be DNA from dead organisms. And if it's DNA from a dead pathogen, it doesn't really interest us so much, right? Because it's not like a viral, virulent or infectious pathogen anymore. But because this squiggle signal can detect differences really on the atomic scale between DNA, I was thinking, okay, maybe as soon as the DNA gets exposed to, uh, the, to the environment to increase temperature, increase UV, and so on, maybe we can actually detect this in our squiggle signal. Um, so... Uh, yeah, and the nice thing is about when you have your own group and money, you just have a crazy idea and you can do it. <laughs> so we started, uh, we set up an experiment, uh, like with just E. coli cultures uh, that uh, that we let live for a while, and then we had them die and be dead for a while and separated, uh, like uh, cell-free from actually cell internal DNA and sequenced that. And we have a quite comprehensive data set together right now. And uh, so here I just have this uh, figure again to again show you, right? Like we expect that we have maybe some sort of difference uh, beyond uh, the variability in this chemical signal due to, due to the DNA sequence that will point to viable or dead DNA. So we have started uh, training residual neural networks, uh, which you don't have to see this anyways. It's just uh, to, to give those of you who are maybe working in AI a little bit an idea to from this a squiggle signal um, predict is the DNA viable or not. And I have no idea yet if it's going to work or not, but our PhD student Harika is working um, on, on this um, at the moment. And I think uh, if that worked, that would, especially for materials such as air, be very helpful because in air, obviously so much dead stuff might be floating around right, that we are not actually interested in. So I think with that, I should really stop. I just really wanted to make uh, the point that I think what is also super interesting or important for our team is any sort of science translation or communication. So just putting a few examples here, whereas we always have a very easy uh, job with the, with the kakapo and all these cute New Zealand species. Uh, but yeah, so we've been engaging quite a bit there. And I also want to mention um, that I'm on the eLife Early Career Advisory Board. So eLife is a, a scientific a publisher that tries to push towards increasing transparency, inclusion, and equity in science. And we are we have this like really fantastic uh, group of early career researchers together that advises eLife to also include interests of early career researchers. And eLife has just um, released a new publishing model that goes away from uh, accept and reject decisions in the in the publishing system. And I just, whenever I give a talk now, I advertise it a little bit. <laughs> so if you're interested, you can read our point of view where we are explaining why this can be important, especially for early career researchers or for 
so far minor uh, minority researchers and disadvantaged researchers. Um, and yeah, uh, talk to me if you're interested in that. And with that, I would like to thank my uh, amazing team. I mean, I, I couldn't be happier with these guys. We are having a really good time in Munich. And if you want to contact us, there uh, are some contact details up there and our most important websites. So thank you very much. Sorry, there was a lot. <laughs> I realized myself now. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have, I think, uh, five to 10 minutes for questions, depending, depending on if anyone wants a salad bar, then I would suggest you already leave, actually. <laughs> Does anyone have anything for Laura? Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for the talk. Oh, okay. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, in your opinion, because I'm quite new to the field of um, nanopore sequencing, what's the main disadvantage of this method? I mean, uh, in um, also on a technical level, on number of reads that you resolution you can uh, acquire with assembly or Yes. Yeah, very good question. So I think like practically the my biggest disadvantage is that like a lot of people ask me, oh, how much will it cost, right? Like per base pair or whatever. And I think for me, it's so hard to predict because it's so variable depending on your sample input, like uh, how, uh, you know, how you extracted your DNA, how clean it is, how large uh, the fragment size of the DNA is, because like the longer DNA fragments will actually result in less throughput of the flow cell, whereas you might need them for assemblies, you know, so it's like, I always feel for every project you start, you have to do a new pilot study and, and optimize it again. That's, I think, the, mo the, the practical disadvantage, which also means, you know, like, especially thinking about worldwide application, you can't really estimate the costs so well. Also, when you write grants, you know, I'm like always just pinpointing it. I hope none of my grand reviews is <laughs> watching this this right now but so yeah so this is uh, this is i think the, the the big disadvantage um and also like with, with respect to you know when it comes to assemblies you you do want to have a few uh, or some very long reads to build have these anchors for for creating these near complete genomes but then you also want to have a a certain coverage because you still have this error rate of around 0.6% now in the data. So to be really certain that you have a certain nucleotide at a certain position, you want to have a minimum coverage still. Meaning you sort of have to find this compromise between like a few long reads and or like more short reads that will also result in more base pairs overall. You know, so yeah, I think, I think you can optimize a lot there. Um, and I also like every time I use a flow cell, I get very different, you know, outcomes. So it's like, it's not as standardizable as, as for example, Illumina sequencing yet. Um, but I also sort of feel it's, that's because the chemistries are still improving so much at the moment. And we are still not at a point where um, there is just an established method, you know, it's like basically as a scientist, you're also contributing to the development of it to an extent. So I do hope that this will come at some point. Um, but yeah, I think that's the main disadvantage. Thanks. Will we do press? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. It was really a uh, very interesting new presentation. You. And uh, I just wanted to, uh, I was curious to know why you excluded real time RNA uh, detection if you want to know if something is uh, living. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so very, very good uh, point because, yeah, we can obviously use metatranscriptomics, right, to look for evidence of RNA because RNA is uh, like less short lived in the environment. And then uh, if we have evidence of RNA from an organism, we can actually assume, okay, this, this, this organism was, was still alive. Um, so uh, I think so. For, so firstly, like RNA extraction and sequencing is more difficult, right? I mean, because RNA is so, I mean, and you know this better than me, but, um, but because it's it's not stable when you are extracting, you have like a lot to take into account, meaning the sort of automated DNA extraction approaches that we are using are more difficult to implement, but also the, the sequencing of it, right, with actually having to do potentially cDNA conversion, 
I mean, you can also sequence native RNA um, in that case. But I think it's like, it's all like a lot less efficient. So for example, when you want to sequence a native RNA, you have to have like a lot of RNA, um, like which I think we would never get from air samples, um, to be honest. And then as well, because you, uh, um, I, I mean, ideally you would get entire like gene transcripts and all the isoforms and so on, which would probably allow you to more efficiently map back to the actual uh, taxon uh, like, you know, taxonomic group that it was coming from. But, but I do think that genome-wide, there's a lot more variation that we can use to distinguish between strains and so on after genes are per definition more conserved, right, across, across taxa. But I think it's a super interesting question to say, hey, we could use a metatranscriptomic approach, like if our last approach with the viability assessment was actually successful, to say we are comparing it maybe in another medium like water with a metatranscriptomic approach and see. And obviously for RNA viruses, this the influenza A virus project, we will look into RNA. But this is really something that Albert, our postdoc who just started this month, is only starting establishing in the lab. So I don't have a lot of experience with that yet, but hopefully in two, three months we will. Yeah, but very good question. Yeah, thank you. So not a methodological question. Um, so you had a slide where you had relative abundance of the different birds that you, you got from the soil samples, if I remember correctly. And then I was wondering, what does this relative abundance actually give us? So is it, can you actually somehow transform that relative abundance to quote unquote real abundance or, and then how easy is it really to get these relative abundance measures? Because clearly your second step of identifying individuals is super cool, but that's just because you have such a special system. So I guess that's not so easy unless you already had a bunch of data, but it seems like the first one could be a more general tool. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think this, uh, yeah, very important question as well. The thing, I think the general discussion with environmental DNA is like, how much can you actually estimate um, that the real quantitative uh, uh, contributions of species to the community, right? And I, I think that differs a lot across the different ecosystems and materials that you're using. For example, for fish diversity in waters, people have shown that there is some correlation between, between actual fish abundance and, and the amount of eDNA that you found for, find for each, each species. I do think that because in the soil approach, we have this like crazy spatially resolved effect, right? That we, we like at the one place, we find a lot of kakapo DNA because it was probably just sitting there. In the next place, we don't. I don't think that this will be very uh, useful for actually saying anything quantitative because it will depend so much on if the uh, one specific species has shed a lot of DNA at this location or not how much DNA the species is shedding in general, right? Like a bird might be shedding more than a bat, uh, like how active they've been at this moment. So I think there is so much variability um, there uh, that, yeah, I think I, I think that that is very difficult for with respect to soil samples. So we, we use this more to actually identify in the first place the samples that had Kakapo DNA in it and, and were then actually positively surprised that we could uh, find like a lot of other species there. Meaning if you, um, for example, did like a more cumulative approach, taking soil samples from many different locations and extracting the DNA from those and sequencing those, you should hopefully get a more uh, yeah, robust picture of the diversity um, in general of a, of a location. Um, that was just not really so much the focus uh, of the research, but yeah, I think in our data, quantitative, not at all. Yeah, what, 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 what we can show there. So it's really just the proportion portion of the reads. So maybe I should actually change the y-axis um, to not be, uh, yeah, to not lead any people thinking into that. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, very good point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I think that we have the chance to talk to Laura over lunch and she'll be here this afternoon and we'll go for a beer if anyone wants to join. Um, but we have an online question that I'll just end. With. Yeah, please. So first, we have some compliments from Tim, Julian, and, and Mary about your talk. And then um, Seiju is asking um, if you opti how you optimize sampling methods for different samples, water, air, and animal. They assume you used commercial kits. And are there any recommendations you can give them um, for choosing the sampling method or kit based on your experience? Uh, yeah, I, I think I think for the sampling 
method, we are still experimenting quite a bit as well. So for air, very quickly, the cyclonic um, uh, air sampling has just worked best for us. The filtering approach didn't result in so much DNA in the end. So that's why we went for that. For soil sampling, I mean, to be honest, we really just take the soil with gloves, right? And put it into like a, 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 a bag. But um, there again, one can highly optimize by taking like soil samples from many different directions based on how broadly I actually want to sample allocation. And, and for, for water, yeah, we are also just, you know, like filtering, um, you know, I think to using very standard approaches. So there I would maybe refer to our eLife publication for the um, CHEM river microbiome study, how we are using filters to do that. And then like, I think what we are doing is the default now, like the DNA extraction is using Kaya Chen kits. Very simple uh, because these are highly compatible with nanopore sequencing. Many other methods are not. Like for example, with phenyl chloroform, uh, we had a huge problems with nanopore um, uh, flow cells afterwards uh, because the phenol is sort of, if, especially if you have low DNA amounts, like blocking the pores. Um, so, so I think this I would definitely recommend for starting. And I said, we are really working on making this easier um, now because I, what I don't like about these standardized kits so much is that you are using so many consumables, right? And you have to like pipette around so much, which maybe all of us think is quite easy, but when we actually try to teach the conservationists in the field, right, who just came from overnight field work, and you're like, oh yeah, now you have to pipe it for an hour. It's not ideal. So, uh, so yeah. But for the for starting it with anything, I would recommend that. Yeah. Okay. So with that, I think we'll we'll close because it's it's at the end. Um, please, uh, you see Laura's email up there, and then please join us for lunch if any of you would like to. So yeah, thank you uh, again, Laura, for coming. And, cool. uh, thank you, yeah. Debbie. Thanks all. Yeah.